It's a delight to be with you. But I have to tell you, as one who spent his career in the scientific community, I get so tired of people who mean well say you can't prove the Bible, but then they'll make some positive statement. I'm so tired of hearing that preamble, this presumption that you can't prove the Bible. Yes, you can. This document, this collection of documents you have in your lap, the Bible, is incredible, and you can demonstrate that it is of extraterrestrial origin. Its origin is from outside our time domain. And I want to give you some examples of things to help demonstrate that this morning. Um, one of the questions that we often get asked is, are there hidden messages in the Bible? And uh, there's a lot of nonsense published in that area, but yes, there are. In fact, Solomon tells us it is the glory of God to conceal a thing and the duty and honor of kings to search out a matter. So we're going to explore some of those things this morning. And I believe that before we're through, you'll have some examples that will strengthen your confidence that that Bible, the Word of God, that we also depend on, is in fact a supernatural document, a unique document. But I'll start by asking you a riddle, and that is, who is the oldest man in the Bible? Anyone? Methuselah, good for you, yes. Methuselah lived 960, 969 years. He's the oldest, the longest life in the Bible. And uh, yet, he uh, died before his father. Yeah, that puzzles you a little bit, doesn't it? He's the oldest man in the Bible, yet he died before his father. Say, I cheated on you. You see, everybody forgets who his father was. His father was a guy by the name of Enoch. And Enoch was an interesting guy. Uh, in the, and we'll talk a little bit about him. He, at the age of 65, something happened in his life that from that point on, he walked with God for another 300 years. Now, what happened was, I should explain something else. The flood of Noah did not come as a surprise. The flood of Noah was preached on for four generations, surprisingly enough. But when Enoch's son was born, God told him that as long as his son is alive, the judgment of that flood would be held back. And indeed, so he names his son Methuselah. That's a Hebrew word from two root words. The word muth, which means his death, that occurs 125 times in the Old Testament. And the verb shalak, which means his death shall, it means to bring or send forth. The combination means his death shall bring or send forth. Strange title. But that's his name. And we discover when we study Genesis chapter 5 carefully that Methuselah was 187 when he had a son by the name of Lamech, and Lamech was 182 when he had a son by the name of Noah. And uh, it was in the 600th year of Noah that the flood came. And the, the, in other words, the year that Methuselah died is the year the flood came. And that was the prophecy. Can you girls imagine what it was like to raise that kid? Every time he caught a cold, the entire neighborhood would go into panic, right? As long as he's alive, everything's right. And that when he dies, that's when the Lord did come. I, the flood did come. Excuse me, when the flood did come. Before I go further, I want to give you a little flavor for the Hebrew language because it's very different. Most alphabets are phonetic. They help us to pronounce the words. The Hebrew letters, the 22 of them in their alphabet, carry meaning, not just sound. The first letter in their alphabet, and even the word alphabet is Hebrew, by the way, the alphabet, the, the aleph it was originally written like an ox's head, showing on the left up there. And uh, we are up there, I think, okay, good. Uh, being the first letter, it means first, or strength, or leader. That's what the flavor of that letter is. And uh, the second letter is Beth. It was originally written like a little house or tent. And the word Beth means house and, uh, or family. And uh, Bethlehem is the house of bread. Bethel, the house of God. The word Beth, the letter itself, carries the concept of a house. Now, when you take an Aleph and a Beth together, you have the word Ab. And if it's a, it, that means it's the leader of the house. 
is, is, is the father. It's the word for father. Now, there's another Hebrew letter called He, probably like an open window or two hands raised. It's a breath, if you will. And it uh, uh, can mean behold or revealed. It also is like a breeze or a breath or a wind or a spirit. The He. You even breathe. We all remember Henry Higgins in, in uh, my fairly. In, Hartford, Hereford, hurricanes hardly ever happen. You to get Elijah Doolittle to get her H's right. Same idea there. Well, if you take the H and put it in the middle of a word, it, the collective represents the essence of that. The word Ab was father. If you put the H in the middle of it, you get Ahab, which reveals the heart or essence of the father. That is the Hebrew word for love. Uh -huh because love is the essence of the Father. See, the point I'm trying to get across, the meaning is in the letters, not just the sound. And so, now, you may, you may recall in Genesis 17, both Abram and Sarai had their names changed, right? What God did is simply put a he in the middle of their, word, of their names, a breath. He filled them with the Spirit. The, the, the Spirit was uh, infused in their lives. Abraham, Sarah. The hey was what connoted that, if you will. Well, as we read our Bible, we really get enchanted with, of course, the first two chapters of the creation. That's pretty exciting stuff. You get to chapter 3, that's the seed plot of the whole Bible is rooted in chapter 3. Chapter 4 is the, the murder of uh, uh, Abel by Cain, and you know that story. From chapter 6 on, we have the flood of Noah, and there's a lot of action there. So the book of Genesis is a very exciting, action-filled book. But when you get to Genesis chapter 5, it's one of those chapters you t you'd like to skip. It's just a genealogy. And if you're in a, in a reading plan, you'd like to sort of skip over that, get into the interesting stuff. No, Genesis 5. What is it all about? Well, it's a genealogy of 10 people. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. See, the problem with that list, it's not translated for you. That is transliterated. Those are approximations of how they were pronounced. I wonder what might, might lie behind these other names. Let's see if we can go through this a little bit. That name Adam is pretty straightforward. That comes from Adama, which means man. No problem with that one. That's fo he's followed by a son by the name of Seth. The word Seth means appointed. And uh, how do we know that? Because Eve tells us that in the previous chapter. Eve said when he was born, for God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew. And you don't know about Cain and Abel. Everybody asks me, where did Cain get his wife, right? He married his brother's sister because he was Abel. Thought I'd help you with that, right? All right, we'll move on. He has a son by the name of Enosh. Now, this is a heavy name to go around with. The word Enoch, Enosh means mortal, frail, or miserable. Can you imagine having him on a sports team? Hey, miserable, you're on our team. You know? <laughs> it doesn't really work, especially in school, I imagine. Okay. And it comes from the root, Anosh, which means incurable. It's usually used of a wound or grief or woe or sickness, something like that. Kenan now, not Canaan, Kenan is a, uh, can mean sorrow, dirge, or elegy. Don't confuse it with Canaan. Balaam in, uh, in Numbers 24 develops a pun on his name. It's another whole story. But Kenan means sorrow. These are pretty heavy names, miserable and so forth. So when Kenan has a, a, a son, he decides this enough's enough. So he names his son when he's born, a, a mouthful but a wonderful name, Mahalalel and Mahal, which means blessed or praised one, and El, the name for God. Mahalalel, kind of hard to pronounce, but what a great name, quite a contrast to his, his uh, elders. The blessed God is what his name means. He, mentioned, he names his son Yared, and there's a story behind that I'll spare you here, but the name Yarad, which simply means shall come down. And uh, that may have a uh, connection with Genesis 6, but that's a whole another story. That brings us to Enoch. We've mentioned already, but what does the word Enoch mean? It turns out that Enoch is an academic phrase which means commencement or more narrow, teaching. Enoch suggests teaching, if you will. 
And then, of course, he has Methuselah, which I've mentioned means his, that Muth and Shalak really mean his death shall bring. The year that Methuselah dies is indeed the year the, the, the flood came. That brings us to Lamech. Now, here's a case where the root word is still in our English language. And we see it evident in the word uh, English lament or lamentation, if you will. In the Hebrew, the word Lamech suggests despairing, despairing, fair enough. Now, Lamech has a son by the name of Noah, and that's de he's derived from Nacham, which means c relief, to bring relief or comfort. And uh, we know that from his father mentions that. Uh, he's, uh, Lamech says in chapter five, uh, 5, says, he called his name Noah, saying, this same shall comfort us concerning our work and toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord hath cursed. Okay, so here's our genealogy now. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahalalel, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. That's the way, that's a rough way they might pronounce it. Let's translate it with what we've learned. Well, Adam means man. Seth, appointed. Enosh, mortal. Canaan, sorrow. Mahalalel, the blessed God, shall come down teaching that his death, whose death? God's death, shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. Man is appointed mortal sorrow. Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down teaching that his death, whose death? God's death, shall bring the despairing comfort or rest. Staggering, staggering discovery here, tucked away in the genealogy of, uh, of uh, Noah. This tells you several things. It tells you that God's plan of redemption was not a knee-jerk reaction to a surprise that Adam sinned. He knew he would from the beginning. Before the uh, creation, he, he appointed those that would be saved. When did God first have his mind on you? Ephesians 1.4, before the foundation of the world. God knew, he knew it, it would take a display of infinite love to remedy the situation, that nothing less than the death of God himself would avail to pay, to pay for the wickedness of sin. But the other thing about this that you learn, well, there's no way you'll ever convince me that a group of Jewish rabbis contrived to hide a summary of the Christian gospel tucked away in a genealogy in the Torah? No way. No way. And yet here it is, tucked right there staying. You see, the thing I want to get across is in your Bible, it's an integrated design. Every detail is there deliberately. The, Old Te the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. There's an example. I'll show you some others. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. It works both ways. And we'll look at a few of those examples. So we're looking at the book of Genesis here. If we study the letter, the, and I should point out something before we go further. You need to understand that all languages flow towards Jerusalem. Nations that are east of Jerusalem go from right to left. Not only Hebrew, but Arabic, Sanskrit, you name it. All nations west of Jerusalem go from left to right. Not only English and German and English, Latin, of course, uh, but also Cyrillic, Greek, what have you. All those that are west go east. Anyway, so they go in different directions. But now here's the book of Genesis, and remember it goes from right to left. And the, the, the most venerated part of the Old Testament, the Tanakh, is called the Torah, which in Hebrew is four letters, the equivalent of our T-O-R-H, if you will. Well, it's interesting, if you go to the first tau, or T equivalent, and uh, then you count 49, 7 squared, 49 letters, and you come to a vav, which acts like an O in effect, and then you count 49 letters, and you come to a resh, and then you count, which is like an R, and then 49 letters, you get to the hey, and that spells Torah. Now you say, well, that's kind of an interesting coincidence. It happens in 49-letter intervals that it spells the name of the books of Moses. All right, that's kind of a curious oddity. Not sure it means anything. You go to Exodus, and the strange thing, the same thing happens. There's a tau, 
49 letters to a vav, 49 letters to a resh, and 49 letters to a he. And again, it spells Torah. Now, when it does that a second time, you get a strange feeling. Someone's playing games here. Indeed, the Holy Spirit may be doing this. Let's watch and see what happens here. The next book is Leviticus, and when you look at it, that doesn't happen, and you almost feel a sense of relief. But when you go to the num next one, Numbers, you find it happens a bit backwards. There's a He, the Resh, and a Vav, and a Tau. It spells Torah backwards. I have no idea how they discovered this. Somebody had time on their hands, I think. <laughs> you go to Deuteronomy, and the same equivalent thing happens. So you stand back from all of this. In 49, 7 squared, 49 letter sequences, you find Genesis, spelled right, Torah, spelled right, Numbers and, and Deuteronomy, it's spelled backwards. That's pretty weird. Well, let's go back and take a more careful look at the book of Leviticus. And when we examine that, we discover in the Hebrew that at seven letter intervals, it spells Yod, He, Vav, He, the unpronounceable name of God. Some people call it Yahweh. And so that's interesting. You, see, you look at this whole thing. Exodus, just Exodus, they go forward. Numbers, Deuteronomy backwards. Right in the middle, you have the name. The Torah always points to Yehovah, one of the unpronounceable names of God, a one used of Yehoshua also, our, our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's enjoy that. Okay. You know, every time I do this, I get goosebumps because that is so staggering to, to see that there. Let me show you something that to me is even a bigger surprise. Let's take a look at Genesis chapter 38. Now, that's a pretty weird chapter. It's one that many parents wish wasn't in the Bible because it's this sordid story of Judah's sin with Tamar. And, uh, you know, when you study Genesis, from 37 to the end is a fabulous wrap-up of this incredible book. And in Genesis 37, you have the, the beginning of the saga of Joseph, who after being a, sold by his brothers, rises to become the prime minister of the world. Incredible saga from 37 to 50, end of the book, to chapter 50. But in chapter 38, they insert this story that is a sordid thing, how Judah is tricked into having sex with his daughter-in-law, Tamar, and then who gives birth to two sons out of wedlock. And many people wonder, what's that doing in the Bible? And, uh, well, it's in there because it's part of the Messianic line for a lot of reasons, but we won't get into that here. The real question is, why is the Holy Spirit recorded here? Let me show you something else about it. And uh, this is Genesis 38, again in Hebrew, going from right to left. And it's interesting that we discover in that text, at 49-letter intervals again, the name of Boaz. That catches our attention. Then we find at 49 letter intervals, we find the number of Ruth, the name of Ruth. And Boaz and Ruth, wow, okay, what's going on here? And then we find in 49 letter intervals the name Obed. And then at 49 letter intervals, we find Yeshe or Jesse as we would say it. And then we find at 49 letter intervals the name of David. Now, so we have here apparently, rather astonishingly, we have Boaz, Ruth, Obed, Jesse and David at 49 letter intervals in chronological order. We have the genealogy of David indeed. Now realize this is in Genesis long before the, after the books of Moses we have Joshua, then we have Judges, then 1 Samuel. Long before David's around, David's genealogy is plugged in. We know that God had planned to have David as the king from the beginning. Israel's impatient. They want a king, so he lets them have Saul for a while to learn some lessons. But David was ordained in Genesis 38. Staggering, staggering implication. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning. He alone knows the end from the beginning, and he demonstrates that to authenticate that message that he sent to you. It's in your laps. It gets better. It gets better. When did the flood end? We all know about the flood, Genesis 6, 7, 8, flood. But in eight, chapter 8, verse 4, the flood comes to an end, okay? And we notice in verse 4 of Genesis 8, it says the ark, the Noah's ark, the ark rested the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the seventh, uh, of the, the seventh month, the seventeenth day of the month, upon the mountains of Ararat. 
Now, if you are a normal, well-adjusted Bible reader, you go ahead and keep reading. But if you've been to one of my Bible studies, you are no longer a normal, well-adjusted reader because you remember I told you every detail is there deliberately. Every detail, every number, every place name in the Bible is there on purpose. The Holy Spirit had a purpose in it. Well, why on earth did the Holy Spirit want you to know that the ark came to rest? I mean, who cares? No, it came to rest on the seventh month, 17th day of that month on the mountains of Ararat. Now, for this one, you need to do a little bit of homework. You need to understand that the Jews have two calendars. And uh, the Genesis calendar is the one that they celebrate even to this day. The beginning of the year is in the month of Tishri in the fall. And that's called the head of the year, Rosh Hashanah. So that's their civil calendar, what I'll call the Genesis calendar. However, they were given in Exodus 12, the Exodus calendar, where God tells them to make that month, the month in Nisan, in the spring, the beginning of their months, because that's where he establishes Passover. And you may recall that in Exodus, Exodus 12, verse 2, God says, this month, Nisan, shall be unto you the beginning of the months. It shall be the first month of the year unto you. So now they got two calendars with two different beginnings. You need to just keep them straight. And so if you compare these, of course, in the Genesis calendar, Tishri is the first month, and in the, in the uh, 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 Exodus calendar, Nisan is the first month, which is the seventh month of the Genesis calendar. Nisan is the seventh month of the Genesis calendar. And it's the Genesis calendar that records the ark coming to rest on the 17th day of the seventh month. So let's put this together. Jesus was crucified on Passover, the 14th of Nisan. How long was Jesus in the, in the tomb? Anyone? Four days? What? Three days. Okay, great. Exactly. So that means he was resurrected on the 17th day of Nisan, which is the seventh month of the Genesis, Genesis calendar. You with me so far? You say, so what? Here's why. Do you realize that Noah's new beginning on the planet Earth was on the anniversary in advance of our new beginning in Jesus Christ. Praise God. Do you get the feeling that God knows what He's doing? Do you get the feeling that He's in control of every detail? Praise His holy name. He's orchestrating even the flood of Noah and the timing ties, coordinates with the whole gospel story. Praise God. The more you study your Bible, you'll discover these connections, these coincidences. Now, the rabbis will tell you that coincidence is not a kosher word. Okay. okay. The, Old Test the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed, and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. Let's take the brazen serpent. I love this one. It's one of the weirdest stories in the Bible. It's not explained. The brazen serpent. It's in Numbers 21, for those of you who want to study it later. The people spake against God and against Moses, and wherefore you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness, where there's no bread, there's no and water. My soul loathed this light bread, meaning the manna. They hated the manna. Lord, and so the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people that bit the people much afraid. They call it fiery because the poison stings, it, it burns. And so the, uh, that bit the people, and much people died from these snake bites. And they're, now they're upset about that, and they repent. Then the people spake against God. Or, or, excuse me, I've got to get the next slide here, okay? Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. We have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And God resorts to a most a strange remedy here. The Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live." Wow. So Moses, Moses made a serpent of brass, put it on a pole, up on a hill, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bit any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. So God set it up. So here's this brass serpent on a pole up on a hill somewhere and of uh, copper or bronze. I won't get into the brass issue right now. Uh, the, but uh, what, what, why is God doing this? There's no explanation. We take a look. A serpent is what? A figure of evil or sin, isn't it? And uh, a brass, why brass? That's the metal that could sustain fire, so it symbolizes judgment. 
Is this an idiom for judgment? You can search the entire Old Testament and never have this explained. Very, it's a, you know, come on, it's, you know, it is a pretty strange remedy that God set up here to heal. If He's going to heal these people, why did He do it that way? He chose to do it that way, and, he, and they did. In fact, this particular remedy creates a problem because that brazen serpent becomes an idol to worship. Many centuries later, King Hezekiah discovers they're, they're, they're uh, praying to this. He destroys it. In 2 Kings 18, um, Hezekiah is doing what's right before the Lord, according to all his, what his father David did. He removed the high places, broke the images, cut down the groves, and all that. And, uh, and for the, unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, that is the, the brazen serpent that Moses made. He called it Nehushtan, which means a thing of brass and he destroys it. But they never explain why did God do it that way. There's no evidence of that. In fact, this becomes the symbol of the medical profession. It leads to a legend called the uh, Aesculapius. And the rod of Aesculapius was used. That legend has its roots, of course, in Numbers 21. Now, in America, they have a way of messing things up. You know, they, they thought, gee, uh, two, two serpents look a little more symmetrical. So they, not un, they call it the caduceus, which is the wand of Hermes, which is a symbol of merchandising. So when you see an American doctor with his car on, a, on the license plate with a caduceus, it's a, you can know he's going to charge you too much, you say. <laughs> now these things happened as examples, the Scripture tells us. Whatsoever things are written aforetime were written for our learning, that we, through the comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. They're written for our admonition and so on. And so, so let's move on here. Let's see. It isn't until you get to the New Testament and you're in the Gospel of John and Nicodemus, the, leader, the leading teacher in that region, came to Jesus and Jesus explains it to him then. John 3 verse 14, Jesus says, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life." Now, the, uh, it's astonishing to me to realize that that's the first place in the Bible this peculiar event of Numbers 21 is explained. And then you suddenly realize that that's why God had the serpent in the wilderness as an indicator, as a foreshadowing of the cross, deliberately, in advance. Did the people of Israel understand that? I doubt it. But God planted it there to be a sign to us, because it leads to the most well-known verse in the entire Bible, verse 16 of John 3. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Praise God. Okay, so it, 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 it's, this is one of these things. See, in, 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 in uh, Gentile terms, prophecy is a prediction and fulfillment. Prediction and fulfillment. In the Hebrew mind, prophecy is pattern. All through the Scripture, you see patterns set up that are, for, that are predictions. And the Numbers 21, the brazen serpent, is a prediction of the cross, interestingly enough. Socrates was recorded as saying, it may be that deity can forgive sins, but I do not see how. It's interesting, this guy had the perception to understand the problem. How can deity be righteous and at the same time forgive sins? What's the, he saw the contradiction. I can't see how a deity can forgive sins. It never occurred to him that the deity might offer himself to be the payment for those sins. He understood the problem for more clearly than most people may and yet he didn't see the solution to it. Because, see, Paul tells us in the second Corinthian letter, chapter 5, verse 21, speaking of Jesus, for he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You and I have no capacity to imagine what it means to have a holy God who's pure, unspoiled, made sin for us. We can't imagine what that embraces. He may have made him to be sin for us. 
in a great design. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed, and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. It's a single 66 book penned by 40 different guys over almost 2,000 years that's an integrated design. You can't prove the Bible. Yes, you can. You can prove it. You can demonstrate its integrity, and you can see where the, who it points to, how it authenticates Christ, and then how Christ authenticates the whole package. But let's take another glimpse of surprises that might be in the Bible. Uh, I always say that everything in there is there deliberately by design. People challenge me, well, what about Numbers 2? Now, what are you going to make of that? Numbers 2. That's all these weird numbers uh, that, that what, may, what might be hidden behind the numbers and details of the camp of Israel here, let's describe. Jesus said, the volume of the book is written of me. You need to discover for yourself that Jesus Christ is on every page of the Bible, not just the New Testament. And so, in, in Numbers chapter 2, we have the listings of all the, the 12 tribes of Israel. You have Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. Then you have uh, Reuben, Simeon, and uh, Gad. And then you have uh, Ephra Ephraim, Manasseh, and uh, Benjamin. And finally, of course, you have Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. Now, you realize there are 13 tribes, by the way. Don't get confused. They always speak of 12 tribes, but they cheat. Because if you want all 12, all of them, you want to call it 12, you take jo uh, Joseph and lump it together. If you want to take one out for some reason, Dan for one reason or Levi for another, you can still have 12 left over by taking Joseph and sp splitting them into two. Once you realize the game they're playing, you'll realize why they always have 12, whether or not Levi's included. He doesn't go to the line of march and battle, so you still have 12 going to battle. And there's, they're listed 20 times in the Old Testament, always in a different order, but there, it's always a subset of the, of the 13. But anyway, moving on here. So we also learn from Numbers 2 that these 12 tribes camped in four camps. The first three, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, camped under the ensign of Judah as the camp of Judah. So Reuben, Sibion, and Gad camped under the camp of Reuben. Uh, Ephraim, Manasseh, and, Eph, uh, uh, and Benjamin under the ensign of Ephraim, and Dan, Asher, and Naphtali under Dan. And so they have four camps. Now, the Levites are camped in the middle. They set out an area where they set up the tabernacle in the middle of their area, and uh, the doorway is always to the east, and that's where Moses and the priests were camped. And then the, the Gershonites, Goethites, and Merorites camped around the tabernacle, but the whole area was the area assigned to the Levites. I don't know how big it was, but it's going to be the basic unit we're going to deal with here, the, the camps of the Levites. Why? Because we're going to discover that the rabbis worked very hard. They give them credit. They really worked hard to fulfill the law as precisely as they understood it, the rabbinical precision. The camp of Judah is instructed to camp east of the Levites. Fair enough. Camp of Reuben was the, the, the south of the Levites, no problem. But that means that no one can camp southeast, because that's neither south nor east. So that's a vacant area, apparently. Only cardinal directions were ordained in the law. And the width of the camp, it would be as wide as the Levites' camp and still conform, but not larger than that. So it would go as long as they needed to for the population. Okay, let's take a look at this here. So we have the, the 22,000 or so of the, uh, of the Levites in the middle, and we have the camp of Judah to the east. Its ensign was, of course, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and so those three tribes assigned to Judah would be camped to the east. No problem there. Reuben was to be to the south. His ensign was the symbol of the man, and they camped to the south, and only to the south. And then we have no one in the southeast, you understand. And nor, nor the southwest, northwest, and northeast. Those are vacant. Okay. Ephraim is to the west, and his symbol, his ensign was the ox, and the three camps that make up the camp, the three groups, the three tribes that make up the camp, uh, camp to the, to the west. And then we have Dan, and his symbol was the eagle. Now you wonder, wait a minute. I remember Genesis 49, his ensign was a serpent. Except Ahezer, the head of the tribe, was uncomfortable with that. So we discover that what he does, he adopts an eagle with a snake in its mouth as his ensign. And that's where Dan picks up the eagle as his, a more comfortable ensign than the serpent, for obvious reasons. And so, be that as it may, we now have the four, 
Now what we need to do is figure out the, the uh, populations. Judah is the largest with 186,000. Ephraim to the, to the west is only 108, it's the smallest. The other two are about the same. Let's, I want to show you an aerial picture that's in your Bible that we've just constructed here for you. It's the same thing that Balak, or excuse me, Balaam, when he was on the hill cursing Israel, as he looked down what he saw. And that's what he saw. That's an aerial view of the camp of Israel. This is in the Old Testament. This is in Numbers 2. It's staggering, isn't it, when you really start putting it together. It's even deeper than that, it would appear at the first time, because it also becomes a model of the throne of God. Because we have the three faces of the cherubim, the man, the ox, the eagle, and the lion portrayed here that are in all the visions of the throne of God, whether you're looking at Isaiah 6 or Ezekiel 10 or Revelation 4. We see the same four names. We discover the design of the four Gospels in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John present Jesus, the Messiah in the one case, the servant in the other, the Son of Man, the humanity by Luke and John, the Son of God. They have a genealogy appropriate to their mission. Each one except Mark. Mark has no genealogy because he, no one's concerned about the pedigree of a servant. Matthew, because he's dealing with a Jewish thing, starts with the first Jew, Abraham, and takes the legal line. Luke, who's a Gentile and a doctor, he takes his uh, uh, genealogy from Adam and goes down the bloodline. A different genealogy. Mary's genealogy is not the same as Joseph's. Ma Matthew has Joseph's genealogy, Luke has Mary's, and it's a very interesting study. And John, of course, has a genealogy, but we don't recognize it because it's the genealogy of the pre-existent one the first three verses of the Gospel of John. Matthew, talk, uh, Matthew to say, to speaks of what Jesus said, servant to Mark, what he did, Luke, what he felt, his humanity, and John, who he actually was. And we have the, the one is written to the Jew, the Roman, the Greek, or the church, depending. And we also have the first miracle in each one supporting that particular design all the way through. And, uh, they have the same proper ending. Matthew, being Jewish, ends with the resurrection. Mark is uh, writing, uh, he, he speaks of, uh, to the Gentile, so he's talking about the ascension. Luke uh, uh, talks about the promise of the Spirit setting up the sequel, Luke volume 2, which we know is the book of Acts. And John sets up his sequel, which of course is the book of Revelation, the promise of his return. So that's what we have. This represent, this, these representations are by those same four faces, the lion, the ox, the man, and the eagle. And that's why we see the ensign of Judah, Ephraim, and Reuben, and Dan in that order on the east, west, south, and north side. Now, I don't have to make a big thing of this, but if you start studying your Gospels, you begin to discover that they also are designed in some amazing ways. Again, the New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed, and the Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. Something, having come out of the scientific community for most of my career, I am continually stunned by the technology that is anticipated in the Bible. Our most advanced weapons technology, bullets that can't miss, cruise missiles that can't miss, are described in Jeremiah and, and uh, elsewhere. The fact that man can wipe himself out with his weapons is something that didn't make sense in earlier years. And today's technology, the world worries about the fact that man can very easily do that. And uh, medical hygiene has its own history in the Scripture. Circumcision. There's no way you'll convince me that Moses knew that you circumcise a baby on the eighth day, that he learned that by trial and error. <laughs> I don't think so. No, God told him that. We now know medically that is the optimum time. If you're going to circumcise, you do it on the eighth day for a lot of reasons. Matthew Fontaine Mari uh, read in Psalm 8 that there are pathways in the sea, and he dedicated his life to finding them, and he is recognized worldwide as the father of oceanography. And of course, the round earth is all through there, subatomic particles are anticipated, the meteorological cycle is anticipated. Global TV, Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation, stand in the holy place. Holy place, the holy of holies. How can the world see what's going on in the holy of holies? a place that only the high priest can go and only once a year after great preparation. There's something going on there that everybody's going to watch. How are they going to do that? On CNN, of course. Mm -hmm. And electronic funds, funds transfer, we all talk about the 666 and all that stuff. The other thing that you may not know, but we need to pay attention to, the physics world, the scientific world is very, wor very worried about the fact that uh, 
uh, the constants of physics are changing. And that's disturbing many. And they are. The speed of light's been slowing down. The other constants are, are, look, are searching every. In Scientific American, in June of 2005, they had an article which points out that if the constants are changing, and they are, that implies that the reality, what we think of as reality, is but a shadow of a larger reality. No kidding, Dick Tracy. That's what, that's what the Bible has been saying all along in Hebrews 11.3, 1 Corinthians 15, that we live in four… The, the uh, Hebrew sage Nachmanides in the 12th, 13th century discovered by looking at Genesis that we live in ten dimensions. Four are directly discernible, six are only inferable. We did, could not, not, not knowable in his vocabulary. And now we've spent hundreds of billions of dollars on atomic accelerators to learn what Nachmanides inferred from the text of Genesis. That we live in, ten is the current estimate, four directly perceptible, three spatial in time, and then six that are inferable and being hunted by these uh, uh, accelerators. We have boundaries to reality we know now. If, we, if I use Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man as a symbol representing man's reach, that which is larger than man, uh, uh, size increases to the right on my little diagram, Things that are larger than man we call the macrocosm, and that leads us into the fields of astronomy and astrophysics. And the great discovery of those sciences in the 20th century is that the universe is finite. It may be expanding, but it's finite, not infinite. Staggering. That's what leads to the Big Bang conjectures and other things. If we go the other way, things that are smaller than us, calling that the microcosm, that leads us into quantum physics and subatomic particles. And the more, uh, most astonishing discoveries there are simply that there's a limit to smallness. That the things get so small you can't divide them anymore, even conceptually. If you try to divide a subatomic particle, it ceases to have a property called locality. It's everywhere in the universe at one time. Shattering, shattering discovery. So what that really means is we live in a digital virtual simulation, a virtual reality. There's a limit to smallness and a limit to largeness. We are bounded in a digital, virtual reality. It's a very, very elaborate electronic game if you want to look at it that way. It is set inside a larger context, for lack of another term we call the metacosm. That's the domain of angels. That's the domain of the demons and what have you. It's, it, these things that we are experiencing and measuring are trans-dimensional. That's what leads to the confusion in the UFO area and so on, and I won't go to that here. But the real point is, the assessment is that our universe is but a shadow of a larger reality. That's what the Bible has been saying all along, and it proves its origin from being that, from coming in from that region. So I want to give you a challenge before we leave here. And I want you to, if you accept what I put on the screen, you flunk the course. I'm putting it on there sincerely, not hypocritically. I really believe it. But if you accept what I put on the screen next, you flunk. And I believe that you and I are being plunged into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does about any other period of time in human history, including the time that Jesus walked the shores of Galilee or climbed the mountains of Judea. Now that's a preposterous statement, that you and I are moving into a period of time about which the Bible says more than it does the gospel period. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, how do you, don't accept that, I want you to challenge that. That's preposterous. How do you challenge it? You got to do two things. First thing you got to do is you got to find out what the Bible really says. That's too important to try to delegate to anyone else. You need to do it yourself. Your eternity depends on it. Now, in our unique environment today, that's easier to do than ever. This part's easy because the Word of God is more available today than it's ever been in human history. You do not have to know Hebrew or Greek to go to the original language. You can do it with a click of your mouse and a pop-up will tell you exactly what that word really was originally and what it means. The software for doing all that is free of charge. If you haven't discovered the Blue Letter Bible or similar kinds of things, you're in for a pleasant discovery. And these advanced information appliances we have, many people carry around six or seven Bibles in their telephone and what have you. And the Internet, you can find out anything on the Internet. All of man's knowledge is a few clicks away. All of man's knowledge is a few clicks away. And of course, the role of small, in my 65 years of Bible study, the one place that I see people grow is in small groups. That's what makes this fellowship so dear to our staff, because it's the one place we've seen it done right. 
small groups, and focusing on making disciples. Praise God. But that leads you to the second part of your challenge. Knowing your Bible isn't sufficient. It is for your sal salvation, don't misunderstand me. But it's not sufficient to get a perspective. What you also need to do is find out what's really going on. And uh, Pilate asked, what is truth? You need to ask the same question. You and I live in the age of deceit. The news media, your schools, even your legal system, almost every, every place you look, you see corruption, you see information that is biased, that's twisted, that's designed to deceive. You need to be able to cut through that. Now, here's the point. The more you know about the biblical scenario, and the more you know about what's really going on in the geopolitical and technology worlds, the more you see the convergence. Clearly, you and I are being propelled into a period that the Bible calls the end times. We really are. I'm not setting dates. Don't misunderstand me. But clearly, we should be living our lives by prioritizing our posture with respect to our coming King, because the King is coming. And there is, we have a window of opportunity. I don't know whether there's days, weeks, or months, or even some years. I don't know. But I know it's coming soon, and it's going to impact every one of us. And so, so with that, you need an action plan. What is God calling you to do? I'm assuming if I ask you, are you saved, all the hands will go up. But I have a different question. Do you know what your calling is? Do you know what God has called you to do? I know one thing He wants each of us, me included. None of it, God is not finished with any of us in this room, me included. We each need to raise the bar on a personal walk with Him. And I, it may involve many things, but it's certainly going to include committing yourself to a systematic program to really learn your Bible. And my main motive this morning was to stimulate enough to realize there are discoveries there that are thrilling and exciting and they're available to everyone. And you can do that as a family, by the way. You can even do it in such a way that your kids will get university credit for doing so. But whatever you're going to do, do it now. If you've come here this morning hearing, to enjoy a nice service and hear some things, fine. But it should result in a change in your personal priorities about Him, is the point. So, and all of this, if you want to double back on it, is going to be on the, on the internet, both by this church and also we have a website, uh, uh, kitrust.org www.kitrust.org. All this stuff will be streamed free of charge. You can take a look at it and try to sift it out in a little more leisurely than cramming it in here in, in this window. And with all that, let's bow our hearts in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. We thank you that we're all here by your divine appointment. We understand, Father, no accidents that all, we're here by your divine appointment. So it's our prayer, Father, that your purpose be accomplished in each of our lives, that each of us would better understand what you would have in response from us as we, this morning, commit ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Messiah, our Redeemer, our coming King indeed. Amen. What a pleasant surprise.